and previously in X-Men, the team has just returned to Earth after saving the universe, thanks to a cosmic level display of power from the Phoenix. And the new art team of penciler John Byrne and inker Terry Austin made their creative debut last issue. Today we are looking at X-Men 109. I am Jason Lapidus. I'm Chris Sanigan. And we are Group of Seven Comics, and we're joined today by our friend, <laughs> I hope, <Thank> and <laughs> uh, amazing comic book creator, cartoonist, Scott Chandler. How are you, Scott? Woo! I'm great. <laughs> good to, uh, yeah, that was, my, that was my woo for myself. That's Confidence. Good. Yes, we're really yeah. happy you're here. How You're doing well? I am very well. I am, I've uh, been looking forward to this. I uh, opened this bottle of whiskey that you guys sent me for my birthday recently. And uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be drinking whiskey and talking about X Men. That's a good thing. All the good uh, things in life. Totally. Great Tuesday night to throw yeah. you uh, to you know to put the the hot light on you here for a spotlight on you for a second. I listened to an interview with you uh, a few years back on Aaron Broverman's Speech Bubble podcast. I remember. And I remember. Yeah. I remember hearing you talk about your love of John Byrne art in the 1980s or at the end of the 70s. Um, and I, I was like, oh, that guy likes, that guy likes John Byrne. I like John Byrne. We should be friends. Yeah. So did he, did he play a big role in your, uh, in your, your taste making in comics? Yeah. Like really early on. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> as like, as you guys have been talking about on your show, whatever you call this thing. The show, sure. Uh, like in the early eighties, like X-Men was the thing like it was the best-selling yeah. comic and and for a really good reason um john byrne was a big part of that i expect um chris claremont no slouch either but uh yeah once i kind of got into i kind of well, i was into superhero comics when i was really little but then it was kind of fantasy that got me hooked you know the conan the barbarians and dc's warlord and all that stuff uh you know, I wasn't like right into X-Men right away, though everyone else seemed to be. Uh, but that was the first superhero comic I sort of got into, uh, you know, when I was like maybe 13 or so. And uh, yeah, John Byrne was a huge, huge part of the appeal. For sure. Yeah. Um, whenever you want to do a plug for your stuff, feel free. I can always just hit mute so we don't have to listen to you, but you can mime. No, but for real. <laughs> Your, your books are fantastic. Chris and I were, were fans before we met you of your work and we read your stuff ferociously and we, we're, you know, both greatly anticipate the next book that you're working on currently, or it's coming out next year mm -hmm. um, from first second. Yes. I'm working on, uh, I just finished book one and I'm into book two of a new kids fantasy series called Squire and Knight, which like you said, coming early next year from first second. Uh, since I've been invited to plug, I think please, I better. Please, I, happen to, I happen to have some books right here. Uh, Vix is my latest thing that is in print. It came out April 2020. Uh, 20. So, you know, great timing. Perfect time to release a book. Um, everyone should go buy this and help out because it's, mm. uh, you know, just disappeared in the mm. pandemic like every other book released that spring. Uh, the book I'm best known for, probably at least here in Canada, is uh, is this book, Two Generals, which is about my grandfather's experiences in the Second World War. People study this thing in school, if you can believe it. And uh, so maybe some people have uh, have already read it, which is cool. But if not, go buy it because, you know, uh, I, I have kids and they like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, there's there's my plug. There's my pitch. I wish I had my copies are up, up right uh, there. I have mm. two generals and Bix there, both am amazing books. I read uh, two generals before I met you or before I got to talk to you, but Bix I had already known you at that point, and I was so excited to get it. And I've never before or after sat and had a drink and read a book that size, start to finish. Uh, alone without inter any interruption from anyone. Like that one, I just put down and had a drink and, and it was completely consumed by it. It is a masterpiece. Oh, it's wow. the most beautiful book. And uh, I'm so happy for you that you got to make what must be a passion project. Um, because I, I don't know who would have been like knocking, you know, please make this book. It was, it felt like very much like it came from right inside. And 
it's it's a gift like to read that thing is just amazing uh it's wow thanks man beautiful book really really special uh, everyone other should get three well, I, I don't i, I don't feel it. quite as strongly about it <laughs> No, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. I remember, I've told you this before, but and you were there, so you'll maybe remember too. But you were showing uh, the first few pages in like computer printout at Fan Expo in 2019 in Toronto. Okay. And it was just these pages that were like, you know, the keys of the piano, and the kid is exploring music. And you were playing with panel layout to convey sound and emotion through you know the elevation like the height of each of these pages or each of the panels pardon me and i remember looking through like you, you had these colored printouts and i'm looking through and being like oh my god like you you figured out a, a completely unique way yeah there this, you go this is bit right here it it really it benefits from like a good slow read i'm uh, amazing just really cool original way of conveying sound and emotion uh through sequential art just awesome i remember this conversation because i remember you pointing to that bit and uh in in seeing the thing with the piano and you turned to me and you said you did it yeah and it, was, it was one of the first times that i realized i had because <laughs> uh that, you know, that was one of the first times i had shown that work to anybody right so, well, uh, so I, was, I, I appreciate it really really great original stuff and uh I, I still haven't seen anything like it and i don't imagine i will from any from a different creator thank um, you it's really it's fantastic I appreciate it. I wish more people had seen it, but like I said, the timing was absolutely atrocious for that book. So hopefully yeah. there's going to be a uh, paperback edition sometime in the near future. So it'll get a second chance. So in, unless it coincides with some uh, new uh, COVID wave, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that will uh, hopefully work out a little better. Well, the, one of the other good things with books is they're, they're not, although they come out in a certain moment, they're not limited to that singular moment in time so this is something i like one of the many things i like about the graphic novel market as yeah. opposed to the monthly comic book market because right. uh, you know with monthly comics you get that 30-day window and with graphic novels you know you 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 know potentially have forever so that's kind of nice uh, we, I, ho I hope that is the case go ahead sorry chris i was gonna say it's funny scott you, you mentioned that because we even you know we're always thinking we're working on like our next project right we're like constantly we're in the moment you know what are yeah. we working on now what do we got we're always thinking forward thinking and even today you know we received an order for you know a, a decent number of the of the books of the, the trade paperback and my first thought was we still we still sell those <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, only like, and it's only like two years ago we're like what? we still what <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, I was talking. Uh, my my yeah. daughter was just telling me that uh, one of the kids in her school only has the first issue, and he he was like really want to find out what happens next. Is she one? Is she one? Like Group of Seven Comics one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was like, I'll send, I'll send you the trade. Just bring it to your library at school. You know, make sure that that kid tell tell Artem that he he gets first crack at it. In the Thank you, Artem. So yeah, she's <laughs> she's starting her like volunteering in the school library tomorrow. So she's gonna sneak a couple copies in there. And, but yeah, that that idea that these things once they're out there, they can they can kind of catch a catch a wind and and hopefully take on a life of their own as they go. Yeah, um, speaking of monthly comics, and hello there, Kevin from Toying Around. There um, he is. Monthly comics. We we're talking about X Men One Hundred and Nine, which Woo! came out in nineteen seventy eight. Um, mine has a cover date of 77 still on it, but I think it does come out in seven. What do you think, Chris? What do you know? It is. It's, it's cover date of 77, but it's out in 78. I just realized. Order reverse. I don't know. On the Marvel database, it mentioned that, but yeah. But I will say in the, uh, so I'm reading this book, uh, uh through the magic of DVD ROM. Um, there it is. Oh yeah. Like all 40 years of X-Men on a one little disc. And, uh, it's divided by decades. The full, it's a folder structure. It's a C drive folder structure, if anyone's interested, of a hierarchical Windows operation system. And it has, uh, yeah, it's, it's in the 1978 file. So there you go. So Marvel thought to put it in the 1978 file, but I think it has the 1977. Yeah, because yeah, cover dates are always right? a, a couple months ahead or behind, or I can never remember. Yeah, they're, they're, they're quirky things. Yeah. Um, just want to show off the cover for a moment. Uh, in print, there's there's mine that I acquired as a as a young collector. This is like a prized possession from my childhood. 
I nice. love this uh, guardian or vindicator or weapon alpha. Weapon alpha. Is weapon However, alpha. he's he's known as weapon alpha in this issue, so let's go with that. He uh, was my first um, comic book superhero that was my favorite that wasn't from another media. So, like loving Batman as a toddler from obviously the Batman uh, sixty six TV show, or loving Spider Man from Spider Man sixty seven. That that's all well and good and like genuine. But this was like I I didn't know that anyone else knew who this character was. When I came across him in an Alpha Flight comic, he was already dead by that point, and they were talking about him posthumously. And right. then uh, he comes back from the dead. Spoiler: It wasn't really him, but anyway. But I was just in awe of that costume, the design of him, the idea that there could be a Canadian character in these American books. Uh, it was just like mind blowing to ten uh, year old little me. And uh, yeah, the, it uh, has a very very important place in my heart. Scott, now, you look like you wanted to say something. Does Weapon Alpha predate Captain Canuck or vice versa? Shit. I think Captain Canuck comes first. I think Canuck comes first. Yeah. Should, like, Chris, while yeah, I show I'm off. on it. Thank you. So just to compare a little thing here, I have just happen to have in hand the original yeah. art um, of this cover, or a obviously a facsimile of the original art, but at its original size. And one of the things I think that makes this cover so dynamic uh, is the rendering, which if you see at the bottom, it's, you know, let me put that closer. It's signed by Cockrum and Terry Austin. So Austin has now joined the creative team and he is a different kind of inker than Dave Cockrum. And uh, he inks with pen and brush. And it really, really shows when you look at some of the details on this cover, it looks like it looks like Cockrum leveled up, but it's Terry Austin adding right. his his fine work to uh, to the cover. Because at first, at first glance, you think it might be John Byrne. A hundred percent, especially right. looking yeah. at at Weapon yeah. Alpha's head. Mm -hmm. So the other note is that in the print version, their signatures aren't there. They actually moved this box down. It was covering Wolverine's elbow because it's a paste up on the cover, and it was taken off, lowered down, and it covers the signatures. But on the original oh. art, it's it's reverse where you can see the signatures, and the paste up is moved up. And it's original the, the position. Gi the giveaway that it's Cockrum, and I only say this is because we've been you know doing this weekly and are now you know seventeen issues in or fifteen issues had the Cockrum run, is the way that he. And so this is this is from a collection. I'm going to show it. X Men Alpha Flight hardcover. Marvel collection where it's got just about you know five or seven stories uh, across the across the eras of Alpha Flight and X Men hooking up, but it's got 109 and you can tell it's the way he draws Wolverine's mask. Yeah, right. it is so pointy. There is no uh, no curve to it. There's no um, it's it stands. I guess I guess and this is what we will talk about as part of the burn piece. Like burn really nails that look i said this last time with on burns first issue for me I'm, i mean it was never a big x-men uh comic kid really growing up in the 80s but the vision in my head of the x-men team is the burn vision or is the burn is the burn um uh, you know yeah uh, art yeah and so when i saw when i see this mask and it's super pointed and not very fluid i'm like oh that's not burn at all that's it's so that's in, in the previous issues, we always talked about that, about how he was never comfortable or didn't seem to, at least from our perspective, hit that comfort zone for Wolverine. So okay, just to now compare it, there's going to be a couple of comparisons today. Like Oops. this is a bit of a bit of a heavy comparison episode. Um, we're going to compare <laughs> hairlines. We're going to compare uh, <laughs> levels of intoxication and we're going to compare <laughs> covers by uh, or different different editions or volumes of, of this narrative because uh, I am a bit of a glutton for this this story, given that it has such a sweet spot for me. So I've got this version, uh, this comic, in a few different iterations. You know, I've got the original one here. Then I have a retelling by John Byrne from 1984, where he tells the story from Alpha Flight's point of view, and from, in this case, James McDonald Hudson, uh, Guardian Vindicator, whatever you want to call him, Weapon Alpha's point of view, That's where it yeah. doesn't cast him as the villain, but cast him as someone who feels slighted and is trying to go get his brother to come back. And I'm, um, sure, I'm sure I had that Alpha Flight issue, but right. I didn't remember it until just now when you held it up. 
<laughs> yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. So and this look, is... look at that side profile too. Like he is beefy. Yeah. He's beefy in the clear in the in the cock room, right? That yeah. side profile is he's leaner. Yes. As well, uh that punch is like this is a, a, a follow-through for a punch as opposed right. to the cochran version yeah which is sort of like a little jab kind of like it's not even a full like this is a full uppercut and it looks like john yeah. Byrne, you know is really leaning into it which is great and then i have it oh geez the classic x-men version from 1986 um or 87 by now 87 signed by terry austin yeah he, he signed my copy which is really cute of him to do so i was reading it there first before i was able to get the uh yeah, the original one, and I have it. You know, I'm reading it in black and white here in my essentials, and then I have an Alpha Flight trade, which I actually didn't open to compare because I don't <laughs> want to read the new color. But like uh, you, like you, I came like like uh, like I came pretty late to X Men, like I yeah. said earlier. Uh, so like you, I kind of used that classic X Men series to sort of get caught up. Totally. I think my first new issue as a regular reader was number two hundred, The Trial of Magneto. Same. Same. What? That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then I so I worked forward from that point, yes. also backward from that point, yes. and forward from 1976 with the classic stuff. Yes. Like my idea of the continuity is probably all messed up because I was reading in three different directions. But but that's one of the great things about those comics is that you kind of still find a way to enjoy it, and you right. fill in gaps in your head, and and sometimes they make a reference, especially since Claremont's writing all of it. Right. So it's he'll make a up. reference. He'll yeah. he'll you know to something that happened five years ago in print continuity, and you kind of like I want to see when they debut that new costume. I want to see when when does Rogue join or when does uh, Shadow Cat take on that name or whatever it might be. And so whenever yeah. you get those older issues, it's sort of so special to see this really nothing moment, right? Because <laughs> uh, it's just because you're into the story and you're invested in the characters. Um, similarly, I think it it reminds me to television back in the day. Where you know, Chris, I know that you you were you're born in the 21st century, but uh, <laughs> the, the idea of really? of reruns and syndication and like you would catch a season of a show, you know, as a as a kid, and like maybe you'd miss an episode, and you wouldn't find it again until maybe if you're in front of the TV at the right moment, years years later. Yeah. So you know, it is uh, it's it's fun to to look at those issues in in that different context. Is like you couldn't just go look it up. There wasn't Wikipedia to find out what happened. So um, to me, contrary to the way it's reframed now in the X-Men animated series, season two, episode five, called Repo Man. Repo Man. They yeah. retell this sort of story very loosely um, where for some reason, you know, Wolverine gets a message and he goes into the woods to go talk to Heather, who they don't tell you who Heather is. And then he is you don't need to guarding him. comes or vindicator, whatever comes out of the ground, similar way and alpha flights all there. So it's sort of like a mix of issue 109 and 120, where alpha flight goes to get Wolverine back as well. And man, vindicator is a prick the whole time. He's not, <laughs> he's not the hero, but for me as a kid, he was the hero. Sure. And it was like, a not quite a misunderstanding, but like a difference of opinion between these two guys as to what, what people's choices should be. And, Vindicator wasn't the villain, you know, but he's like, oh, he, he really drops all the silly, snarky, re you know, remarks in the cartoon. Um, and in the comic book, he's we're going to see he's a little, you know, he's, he's rough. He's kind of like our Cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> when, it, when, when it comes that's to this, <laughs> that's a hilarious description. <laughs> yeah. And but so John Byrne adds on these extra pages for like what happens right before the story where, you know, and what happens when he tries on his suit for the first time and, and he finds out the Wolverine left. Like, it's like, we have a team and he, he, he's gone. And I remember when we first started this series, Chris, I was talking about Major Chasen. And I was wondering yes. why I knew his name. Yes. It wasn't, it's from this. Right. They, it's, they call him Chasen in the issue and they call him Chasen on the cartoon as well. Yeah, and that's the so, first. That's Giant Size. And Giant, giant Size, size number one. When, when Xavier goes to recruit, yes. there's the scene at... The secret base in Quebec wasn't the base called Alpha as well. It might have been, yeah. Um, and, and that's where they recruit Wolverine. He's like, "I'm out of here." <laughs> Xavier, Xavier just basically says, "You want to come with me?" He's like, "Why not?" <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's really not a lot to it. But anyway, so, <laughs> I, I don't want to go into like too much of the back and forth with the various versions because we should dive in. Mm -hmm. This the Alpha Flight issue really focuses on a what happens from Max's point of view before. Mac is what they call it, the nickname for James McDowell Hudson. Yeah. Um, 
Max point of view when Wolverine leaves and then it's post his death where Heather is in a hospital bed after like a, a breakdown and, and, and a, um, a misadventure and Wolverine or Logan has gone to visit her in the hospital and to be with her and help her recover. And she's telling him about what it was like from their point of view as a couple when he left and what it was like for Mac to go get him and to bring him back, uh, you know, from, from her point of view, from witnessing it from there. So Wolverine in, in this comic, besides the, like the episode that happens where the, the fight actually happens, he's really calm. He's not the combative situation. He's reflecting. He's like, give me my handle it wrong. He was just a very, he was like, that's my introduction to that character is he's this guy with duality and he's not just this pint sized, uh, you know, ball of fury and, and adamantium claws, but he's a guy who like regrets some of his choices and, and reflects and misses his misses his brother and like never had a chance to patch things up with with this guy who kind of saved his life back in the day so it was a really a really different way of looking at those characters and he's never been the villain for me and so i always dislike when vindicator is is looked upon as as a villain anyway well i'll sit i'll just loop back because the question from scott was captain canuck which came first please well, captain canuck first issue is july 1975 Oh, okay. This is 1978. So. so that's a couple years earlier. Definitely. And I think the key reason you bring that up is because their costumes are so similar. They're both flag inspired, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, do has anyone ever read anything about Byrne commenting about doing a a better version or his version of a Captain Connect costume? Because it's Yeah, I don't I don't really know the history there or if there is any. I didn't care enough to Google it, but sure. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure it's Googleable. But uh, I mean it's a pretty like no offense to either character, but just slapping a flag on a costume is pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty basic stuff. I mean, it's 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 easy to believe two people might have come up with the same idea independently. But I'd sure. be surprised if Byrne wasn't aware of uh, of Captain Canuck. Well, I wonder. I mean, at the point is he living in the states? Has he has he moved to New York by by the mid seventies? Yeah. I couldn't so tell you. I'd, one I'd of the be guessing, yeah. One of the big differences, I guess, for, for folks out there is, um, in the internet world, Captain Canuck would be something that's in print in Canada for Canadians, whereas Weapon Alpha Vindicator Guardian is a Canadian character made for an American company for American readers. Right. And all, as a kid, it was enough. Like, I thought it was Canadian. It was amazing. And Wolverine yeah. is, like, named as Canadian and that's really special, but they're not characters that are created in Canada for Canadians. Right. It's sort of like this, uh, someone on the outside uh, telling you what you're like. Yeah. So I don't, Burn, I, yeah, I don't Burn know any. Lived, Burn lived in Canada yeah. for a time. Yeah. yeah. If memory but, serves, he's born in England, moves to Canada, like Calgary area. I, I want to say Calgary. Yeah. And, um, and then I'm assuming he, if, I don't know what point he moves to the States, but I think he's still in the States now. Yeah. But I, I mean, the way that Byrne depicts Canadians, I mean, I don't know any Canadians that are like wearing plaid. It, it's such a stereotype, these these plaid flannel shirt wearing guys. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't I, know where they get that. It's an offensive stereotype, but it's, you know, <laughs> again, it's for Americans to understand Canadians better. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll just have to take that for what it is. <laughs> um, should we dive right in? Yeah, let's get into it. Let's do All it. right, let's take a look at this issue. Let me just get this up here. I know it's like it's common that we're supposed to say hi to people in the chat. So while you're getting that, while you're getting it up there, as you said, Chris, we'll say hello to uh, Kevin. Toying around is here. Obviously, that's great. Nice to see you, Kevin. Uh, Trevor One Six Shooters here. Hey, Trevor, how you doing, man? And is my shirt plaid? Uh, I guess you know what we're in a postmodern age where if it's plaid to you, then <laughs> that's all that matters. It's all Tukes hockey and Danish beer. I yeah, took off the age. Danish beer. This is also like such a big time to put Wolverine front and center. You know, we finally have. I'm glad um, you brought that up. Like yeah. this is the first issue that's kind of not part of that long run. It's a, it's start of a new arc, and finally we get a Wolverine issue. And I wonder if it's going to feel like our Wolverine, or is it going to feel like a, a, a proto version, like we've been reading for the last 17 issues or 16. And is issues. this? Is this the the start of of Wolverine as we know of the path of the path sure. that Wolverine comes to dominate the team sure. and dominate the team book and could because exactly I had that as one of my notes is that up to now Wolverine has featured almost almost in, he's almost been it, uh, 
non-existent on the covers right. of, the, of this yeah. run. He's definitely in the background of the ensemble. If at all. Like, if yeah, at all. It's, yeah, it's almost yeah. always Storm, yeah. Colossus, Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler, and Cyclops. And then Cyclops, Banshee. Banshee Phoenix. sometimes, yeah. 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 Um, uh, the classic X-Men version, uh, you know, covered by Art Adams. Cool the inset art on the inside cover is Art Adams as well, which is kind of a cool picture. Um, but I'm not going to show you because I don't love you that much. Ooh. The additional pages in this issue are drawn by Kieran Dwyer. Who, if you don't know, happens to be John Byrne's stepson. Who is Kieran Dwyer? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. I know, I know they worked together on a few things back in the day, but I did yeah, not yeah. know there was that connection. That's it. there. You go. Okay. The, the, yeah, that's that's just that's just science, bro. Uh, Dragon Eye sixty nine. Leave my toys alone. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, we're we're gonna lots of X Men to come, and I hope you're uh, if you're not a big fan of X Men already, hopefully you will be by the end of this. And I don't know when the last time we had Labats. I don't know, but I don't. I couldn't tell you the last time I had any Labats, Trevor. Uh, so who knows? A blue? You can't remember last time the blue? I twenty years, thirty years. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ov? Not long enough. <laughs> All right, going to crack this one open, Chris. Let's do it. Let's get in there. Great cover, by the way. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. So they're home, right? They've been in space and they're finally back. I'm going to actually, do you guys mind if I full size this thing? Do it. Yeah, man, do it. All right. We don't need to see your faces anymore. I love and... that we're looking at a version that has the ads, the, uh, yeah. oh, the, the not at all legal PDF I found on the internet to look at. Uh, it did not have any of the ads, which I was bummed about. Sorry, dude. Yeah. I also like it has the staples. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is really scanned from an issue, which is there, really special. There's a whole other YouTube show where we just talk about the production of the actual book and look yeah. at the ads. Let's start right. Let's start that show. <laughs> when I first read this, I saw Wolverine coming home, you know, coming through that the front door, and he's got, like, the puka shells, <laughs> the <laughs> necklace on. And it looked to me like he was he had his brown and tan costume underneath. Yeah. yeah. And he says, you know... Man, I got to get out of these alien threads before I start climbing the walls. I could not understand for the life of me what he was talking about. You know, like he's wearing his costume, but they're alien threads and he's itchy. Uh, I, th I was that that was that was one of those things where I really wanted to know what happened before, you know, right. for these just small anecdotal moments. And Burns drawing him hairy. Like he's got hairy arms and a hairy chest coming out of that shirt. And that's the first time we, that he's actually like a furry guy. Anyway. And he's just peeling out of his clothes coming through the door. <laughs> just as most toddlers do. <laughs> we, we, the three of us all uh, have had a toddler son. Yes. And have seen, you know, that scene happen where the kid comes home and pants off, socks off. Like, <laughs> forget that. This is crazy. I love how the X-Men are dressed. You know, like it's, they're really a sign that the, artists don't have a sense of how young people dress in 1977 78 yeah you know i don't know who dresses like scott when they're supposed to be in their mid-20s but uh anyway <laughs> that's a very high turtleneck <laughs> yes and was lalandra to your knowledge chris was lalandra colored with that orange or like tan more tan color or was she sort of maybe it was you know, ambiguous I, before I, yeah i don't think i actually either, you know i don't think i even cared to notice before i don't think it was right yeah and i don't know why storm isn't wearing a her street clothes she's wearing obviously her costume but it looks good it makes the the whole page work as a splash I, I like how that cape yeah it fans out across you know the entire uh, that that real estate there yeah it's like there's a lot of room for artistic interpretation right to no idea of... what moira mctaggart's wearing <laughs> but then look at that nightcrawler teleportation his bamf yeah. How how good is John Byrne? Come on, that's awesome. Anyway, do you want to do? Yeah. Anyone here care to read any of the particular voices? Like, do you have any favorites, <laughs> Scott? Do you do any accents better than others? No, no, not in the slightest. <laughs> not in the so I say you like, can as, do Lalandra. I was going to say <laughs> as the oldest one in the room, you can do <laughs> Professor. <Hans. laughs> so that, either way, they're coming home. We get their usual Claremont. Uh, preamble and sort of long narration but the bottom line is they're home and they're really glad to be there they've just been across the galaxy all right in an unknown place and they are grateful to be back so they're just you know that regular group banter between them but nothing of note 
other than yeah. what we've already talked about. Yeah. Their clothing. I like Peter's sweater vest. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah, he he draws his his figures. His like you were saying last issue, Chris. Like his proportions are really consistent with his characters. Yes. Like they stay on model much better or much tighter than uh, than Cockrum's did. Yes. And I like when you flip pages. You know, Moira's mad that uh, Nightcrawler teleported ahead of her, and she sort of calls him out. And as we as we go to the next page, she's like, "Kurt Wagner." And you, I don't do Scott. Yeah. I don't do accents when I'm. I have to get a little into it. Can't rag, rag it out. <laughs> sounds like a grizzled old. And she says, "I've told you not to teleport inside the house." Like you know, I'm I'm the the matron now, and uh, even though I'm not sleeping with the the patriarch of the house, you know, we, there's an alien for that now. But uh, you're not supposed to teleport here. And then we get a John Byrne kiss. Like I feel like I've seen a thousand times. Like he's drawn that with every yeah. different couple. Like a full you know? mouth. Yes, th- these are open mouth <laughs> kisses, right? This is not 1970s television <laughs> yeah. where it's just lip and lip. Come and here, you. <laughs> this noise should be there. <laughs> this uh, this really stood out to me when I was reading this. It's one of those things that is very uh, kind of puts this in a certain period of time. This like shut up, woman. Now kiss me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, apparently that was a thing we did in uh, 1978. Yeah, I, I don't remember doing that in 1978. <laughs> I mean, I I mean, I was six, but uh, yeah. But, and uh, she was seven, and boy, oh boy, did yeah. <laughs> sparks flew. Yeah. So yes, they they they've arrived home. Banshee's happy to see her. That's great. Uh, Storm goes up to her apartment at the top of the house, which, like this, this is like a staple now of X Men, where she lives in like the attic. The lost or really? attic of the of the mansion, and she has this garden in her in her space. I mean, I remember in the two hundreds, her her still having that space in the mansion, right? Um, for a long time, and yeah, you know, she talks to her plants, and she starts up. You know, she waters them because they're thirsty, but it's just an excuse again yeah. to get her naked. Yep, yep. Every <laughs> time, <It's>, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I loved it every single time as a kid. I was curious. About what was going on behind that hair? Yep. And, and uh, yeah, we, we, Byrne could draw um, Storm or Alpha Flight's Aurora any day of the week, and I was happy as a ten-year-old. What's up, Jason? Jason Lowe is here, and uh, I'm sad to see there's no Jamie Madrox in this issue, but uh, uh, but there is a mention. Well, let's. There's let's, a Madrox uh, mention. I have to say, if I've learned anything from this show, it's uh, that I've been pronouncing uh, Jason's last name incorrectly for years, <laughs> which which I apologize for, Jason. I, uh, you know, I'm going to get it right in the future. Jason shared a really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think this mad face here in the chat is not about the pronunciation, but about the Madrox. About the lack of Madrox. Right. Yes. Yeah. Jason shared an interesting post. Uh, would you say what about a year ago? Um, where he talked about his name pronunciation and and uh, sort of told a, a really good story about the feelings of wanting to fit in and not wanting to be teased for the way last names are pronounced and sort of said moving forward, let's talk about let's 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 go with Jason Lowe. Um, I think it, you, the story you told Jason was that he, as a kid, a teacher said, "How low can you go?" Or like, did like a did some shtick with your last name in a way that made you uncomfortable, and no. you decided to then say, "No, it's Lou," to like shut down the the teacher, and it stuck. And no. you you know made it had made an effort to unstick it, and uh, it it was a really that's a whole other side story and a really good conversation, and yeah. uh, it got me thinking tons about those kinds of those kinds of conversations and how they need to be had. So it was a good one. Yeah, there you that's go. Interesting. It's Absolutely. a little origin story. Himself. Yeah, it was, a, it's a neat story, but uh, Jason tells it better because it's from the heart. I'm sure. Storm naked Aurora. <laughs> we were, did I already put this up? I was in love with Aurora too. Um, <laughs> Just gonna keep it on this page for a while, especially the second costume. But that's again, that was the world we were in where like women were being objectified for children. Yeah. Uh, really, really strange. So they have a scene with Jean's parents. They're still talking about how things have been really odd with her and her parents are scared of her. As Scott says, they're scared stiff, especially your dad, Um, which was inappropriate. I mean, come on, don't do that. And then Byrne gets to redraw like a flashback of some of the events. 
And you can see Wolverine is bandaged for some reason. Well, he got he got booted halfway across the galaxy. He got punched into so um, hard. He got punched so hard that it, what do they call it? Uh, escape velocity. <laughs> I don't know what a bandage around a rib cage. Oh so, yeah, some bandages probably yeah. work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And where do so, they get them from? Doesn't matter. No, well, on the star jammer on the ship. So we get to see Corsair is from Earth. He probably had some uh, Earth bandages. Totally, yeah, totally compartment. He he just reminds me so much of the Peter Quill movie version. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, of you know, yeah. Anyway, I loved I loved the Star Jammers when I was a kid. What was it about the Star Jammers? Just anything to do with like space pirates. Right, right. I, I don't know the comedy. Like it's it's kind of a cliche, but like any anything like combining those two genres, sign me up. Probably still to this day. You know, I just I'd love pirates in space. Yeah, space pirates. <laughs> Storm in the all together. Yes, Chris and I you, we, we learned taste. this taste right that together. figure of speech meaning being in your in your nakedness. I asked my wife Laura about that too. I was like, uh, "Do you know this figure of speech?" She says, "Yeah, it means naked." It's like, how did I? Like, why aren't you on our years. show? You missed an important, <laughs> yeah, part of your education. Totally. Do you want to keep flipping? Yeah, or let's do we want it. to stop at any of this? No, let's well, go. No, they're super sea monkeys. That's no. I'm going to start the ad uh, show. <laughs> the ad show. Has I'm, going to, I'm just going to talk about all the parts you guys skip. <sighs> I love also the su- uh, that. Uh, go back, Chris, please. Oh, okay, sure. The superhero <laughs> women. Superhero women. Um. And then how to draw comics the Marvel way. Look at that. It's already there's an ad for it. Son of Origins, I know well. Yep. As a as a you know, all Stanley just putting it all forward. A yeah, quick man. thought about this. There just really is this ongoing narrative in in um wider culture, but always giving credit to the writer. I yes. was watching or slash listening to the what do they call that series now? On uh, Assembled, I guess it's the Disney Plus oh, yeah, sure. behind the scenes series yeah. that looks at any of the, the Disney Plus series or movies around Marvel. And I was watching and listening to the episode about the Eternals. And they kept talking about Kirby's Eternals, yes. And they talk about Neil Gaiman's Eternals. And every time they talk about Neil Gaiman's Eternals, uh, Eternals, there is no sp- like word balloon or speech bubble, but there are pictures by John Romita Jr. Right, hmm. right, and it's like, oh, but in, we're looking at design in Gaiman's Eternals and taking inspiration from Gaiman's. And I'm like, you mean John Romita Jr.? Like, yeah, there, there just is this idea of there's one author, there's one sort of source, and the writer is the start of all those things. This is um, a huge pet peeve of mine, which uh, you know we could we could easily fill a show just with me ranting on this. But yes, it's uh, you know for hundreds of years uh you know people understood books to have you know an author and potentially an illustrator and you know with comics and the rise of graphic novels in the last couple of decades people have just and you know the the system is built to work that way amazon listings Mm -hmm. and library listings and card catalogs and blah 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 um and yeah they're trying to kind of fit you know, a, a square peg into a round hole there, but it's just, it's just not how comics work as, as right. you guys well know. And it's not a problem for me. Who's like a single creator. I both write and draw and because you, know, you can't work with anybody. Else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm a monster. Um, but uh, yeah, like I know some people who, I mean, they're like, like famously here in uh, Canada, um, uh, Mariko and Jillian Tamaki were, nominated well mariko was nominated for the governor general's award for this one summer right. and and jillian the artist was not <laughs> because they have a separate category for illustration and uh and and that's when it really like that's when i really got a burr in my saddle about right this. Wow. so i mean no like no offense to mariko who is also amazing but like like so much of that book if people have read it is uh you know, just just the sense of place that Jillian is able to 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 conjure through her art, and it is BS. Jason Lowe has it correct. Yeah, um, yeah. It's um, yeah. We really have to get to a place where people understand the writer and artist as a comic as co-authors, mm. and it's a, it's an uphill battle. 
but uh, yeah. Sometimes, I mean, th that's, I'm, I'm really happy to get into it at any point. I was wondering if we do it you know, later or after you've had a few more drinks because um, <laughs> we'll get the, the truth out of you. But mm. there are so many different versions of collaboration. And famously within comics, there are, let's just, let's just oversimplify and say the three versions. There's the solo creator cartoonist who writes and, and draws the whole thing in whatever order they want. That That's just one person gets the credit because they've made the whole thing. Sure. And there's the version that is script, the assembly line version where someone writes a script, passes it on down the line for, to a penciler, a letter, inker, colorist, and editor is involved in, along the way. Right. And there's the other version, which is famously called the Marvel method, where the writer gives or the editor gives a directive. Either way, there's a directive as to what the issue should be about broadly. Mm -hmm. The penciler goes and basically draws out the whole comic, going for storytelling, pacing, um, putting the emphasis where they want or where they feel it's best. And then the writer comes in and scripts it after the images are already rendered in pencil. And then it's, again, reviewed by the editor and inked and whatnot. Uh, and then every variation from that sort of tree of three. Um, yeah, like, I, like every every team is going to, like you say, be some... For sure. Very, you know, there's going to be a... You know, it's going to be as unique as every set of collaborators in terms of who does how much lifting storytelling. Right. Is. Which is why I think it's so challenging is because it is so variable and nuanced sure. depending on so many things that our world likes to simplify things into its most simple form for conversation. Sure. Right. We like, we create an iconography around how things are made. Yeah. And the version we've done has sometimes led to what you could call a creative injustice. Sometimes it's, it's not so inaccurate. You yeah. Know? I like, I feel like, even in instances like Alan Moore, his yes. his scripts are famously dense and yes. detailed. And you were talking about before I think we went live. You were talking about Frank Miller's uh, Batman Year One scripts, which were also very detailed. Because mm -hmm. you know, Frank Miller is obviously an artist also, and is visualizing the pages. Um, you know, you know, like any comics writer uh, probably should. But um, even then. I've just there is so much interpretation on the artist part, so much. like so much, <laughs> so much. <laughs> like yeah, even even working from a detailed script and yeah. sticking to it, there there's just so much interpretation. Yes, that just yeah, you know whether it's sixty forty or eighty twenty or. But that's us wanting to oversimplify it into it's, into yeah. numbers. I mean, come on. Yeah, like it's 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 always some sort of blend of two people's storytelling developments. yeah the, the way i've been thinking about it of late and i can't remember and forgive me for this i forget who brought it up but um i think about it as drafts right and mm -hmm. the final draft is the thing that gets printed yep um mm -hmm. but you know in the case of chris and i you know we're working on obviously our comics chris uh you you write up a draft like the the thing it starts with you yeah. And you kindly like included me in, in, as you write, you kind of like, well, tell me what you ideas you have. And if I had an idea, you know, you, you would have heard, you know, you'd hear it out of me, but you write a draft and then I kind of ask questions when it's done and you maybe change something, maybe don't. And then I do a draft that has pictures and then we right. change some things and maybe we don't. Yeah. And then we put together, you know, this final draft that gets published, but there's, like it's like iterations of a thing. So for someone to say, "Oh, Chris does the words and I do the pictures," it's like it's not exactly like that. Yeah, it's that no, no. I, I took your script draft and I did something to it to make it a different a different thing. Um, but obviously, like it it starts the, the first draft is coming from you. You know. Yeah. Um, the way I've always looked at it is the writer tells the story to the artist. They may hmm. tell a very detailed story or hmm. a very loose story. And then the artist tells the story to the audience. <laughs> right? I, I hear you. Yeah? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's yeah. in, it's interesting, you know? It's really interesting yeah. to kind of consider. Um, I, I know that in my really limited experience drawing comics, I do feel like I'm telling a story by what lines and shapes and 
you know, flow I create um, based on the story. Yeah. Based on the story that's been told to me. And yeah. I always it, think yeah, I it's mean, interesting. Please. Yeah. Fair, I always think that like the final printed product, when I look at that product and I try to try to line it up with like what the additional, what the, what the initial draft storyline outline was, I'm always amazed. It's like something else. Like I'm, <laughs> That's because it's like, with, with yeah. you and me, it's broken telephone. No, I know, I know, but, it's, but no, but like, I mean, I have yeah. a, I have a vision, uh, not a vision. So I, I, you know, if I've written down a, a scene or an issue or whatever, a story arc, yeah, you know, I have, a, and in my head, some cinematography of like what might happen, and it's on, sure. it's described in scene and whatever. Yeah. But when I look at the actual final like issues or the trade paperback, I'm always still blown away by like, oh wow, it took. It took all that work and, and Jason, it took your heavy lifting to get it to a communicable graphic piece. Mm. Like, sure. I, like, honestly, even, like, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Even with my own stuff, like what I write is not always necessarily what comes out the other end of, of the art stage. In fact, it often isn't like Jason, you said you talked about drafts. Like I very much think of the art. You know, I, I, I write a loose script, then I thumbnail. That's a new draft. Pencils are another draft. Inks yeah, are another oh, draft. for sure. And so on. And it's it's all just an opportunity to refine and clarify. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and yeah, some, some pages turn out exactly like how I wrote them and other pages, not at all. Yeah. yeah. And um, like it's, I don't know, sometimes this comparison is done to death, but, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like directing a movie. Like you, you might have started from a really detailed and excellent script, but when you get things in front of the camera, the reality of translating them into a visual language, uh, you know, a lot of times there are things that you could not have hand anticipated at the writing stage. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the artist is doing a lot of storytelling just by the, by the nature of the form. I also think it's probably it varies depending on the degree of professionalism or professionality in the, the dynamic. Like Chris isn't like, we're not a financially sound or profitable like venture. It's two friends working. We don't make together. good decisions. So. <laughs> we don't make good decisions. But by that, I mean that Chris can't like, you wouldn't say to me, here's the largest battle scene with all the horses, motorcycles, trains, and helicopters known to man, draw this for 24 pages. Right. You know, uh, you'd know that it would, it would break another person to do that. So there, if I don't want to draw something like I'm, I'm just not going to draw it. Um, it hasn't gotten to that point yet. But uh, whereas if you are being paid by a corporation to deliver a particular illustration, you're going to do your best to fulfill that financial commitment. Uh, excuse me, that was zombie cap dropping his shield. Damn well, no wonder his arm's falling off. That's, That's true. Shield. I love that we've had this entire conversation with the <laughs> ski monkeys ad on the screen. Oh, playing with action figures, too. <laughs> Trevor16 Shooter says certain books become <laughs> artist writer books, and Watchmen comes to mind for sure. For sure. Claremont Byrne, Gaiman McKean, right? On Sandman at first. Sure. Yeah. I think so, too. They really, their identity kind of comes around those creators that are in mind. Dave Gibbons had a huge impact on Moore's story written writing. As as uh, filled out as Moore's script was, Gibbons suggested a lot that added to the Watchmen story. I love hearing those interviews with those creators or reading, you know, behind the scenes yeah. to understand the contributions they make because um, they usually make it better, right? The when you have strong collaborations, the yeah. book gets better. Which brings us back to X Men and the Sea Monkeys. John Byrne is no slouch as a writer, right. as a creator overall. And you know, I'm wondering at what point he starts to flex. Um, Claremont stated that he would talk out the issue with Cockrum. They were friends. They would be in New York together, and they would talk about what should be in the issue. Then Cockrum would go draw, and then obviously Claremont would come and script it after. But the idea of the plotting was a collaborative process that Chris gets more credit for, but there was that, that interaction. And I imagine it's similar with Byrne. Um, and as, you know, Byrne gets further into the series, he starts to try and yeah. assert himself more and more. Mm -hmm. Anyway. There's a, there's a scene coming up probably within a couple of pages that I want to 
I'm glad we had this conversation because it's gonna it's gonna <laughs> dovetail nicely into into a bit of storytelling I wanna I wanna highlight coming up. You're the only one that's glad about that conversation. Okay. By the way. Okay. So <laughs> the X Men are recounting their journey to the stars. Um, awkwardness between Scott and Jean. Again, lots of stuff to read and then kind of get past because it's not the fun part of why we're here. Methuselah and, shows up. Methuselah. I'm really <laughs> glad Jode is in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad. Really glad my issue that I was going to be on for had showed for one panel. <laughs> it's Chode. The, Bless you. Honestly, that, that apostrophe is very important to avoid <laughs> anything appropriate. This I is a kid's comic. I don't accept it. <laughs> um, back on Earth. And then there's an interlude. And we see a hand on a control panel. Target marked. Tracking systems locked on. He's stationary at the moment. Estimate primary contact in two hours. Wolverine is going to stand still for two hours. Perfectly still. Did you guys know that? Well, sure. That's how Canadian radar systems work. Yeah. <laughs> um, in this amazing issue of Classic X-Men, they talk about behind the scenes, we see a really awkward drawing of Mac with really, really bad eyes. I'm going to show you guys this. This is not my favorite drawing of James McDonald Hudson. Uh, right there. Top. Oh, Top. these are the, these are the pages. From the you have some additional pages by Kieran Dwyer, and okay. it's Mac getting ready for the mission, uh, looking at Wolverine performing naked, having uh, a tank, a sure. size comparison, so we kind of know what the fight will be like, and then him putting the helmet on. And it's not on all the way yet, so his nose is exposed, making his head look too long. But I, those eyes up there are just creepy. Yeah, no, that's. And the next page has like <laughs> Moira McTaggart, fig- sorry, Melandra, um, Melandra, figuring Lelandra. out how to be a person on Earth. These mm. extra pages that Claremont gets to write, you know, with again ten years of uh, hindsight, I guess, on what to make the issue flow better. Um, I feel like neither of those pages added anything at all. No. True. Yeah. The- <laughs> Lilandra gets to try. Oh, she forgot a shower. Oh, oh damn. And she's yeah. wet. And there's some <laughs> kissing. Yeah, anyway, it happens. Well, it's, amazing. It's, a, it's amazing how, you know, again, you raised this to my attention, Jason. I didn't realize that in the classic X Men run, with the, you know, the, 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 it's 10 years later, and, and Claremont goes back and retcons a few things here and there, uh, changes some verbiage here and there, um, maybe. Uh, it changes some of the things to reflect where the characters are 10 years later, even though that's not what happened in the initial piece. Sure. Um, and Scott, to your point, Scott, it, it's it's almost a lot of it's fluff. Um, a lot of it's yep. interesting, sometimes interesting. But I was going to say that it does speak to, you know, Scott, you were saying that, you know, you got into the classic X Men run uh, and then you went backwards. And Jason, you were, that's how you got in. Yeah. And, and well, what a marketing move by Marvel to, yeah. to reprint those as classic X Men. Uh, that so that people could jump on and then go back and explore uh, this canonical run, and at the same time, Claremont, I guess at that point, being like, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna reprint these." Well, just give me a couple of pages. I might want to change a few things and fix it some things. It's, so, it's a really interesting premise, and you think about it from just a, a developmental piece. Two things. First, yes, I, I agree. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> totally. Okay, three things. First was the agreement. Second thing was it is I would say um, commonplace at Marvel for them to reprint under a new title, like Spider Man was being reprinted in Marvel Tales and Fantastic Four was reprinted in Marvel's Greatest Comics. Is that what it was called? Um, There's several, uh, you know, Marvel Two and One sometimes reprinted old Captain America from uh, his title. So the reprinting stuff was was common practice mm-hmm. in the '60s and '70s. Um, second point. Page count changes between 1978 and 1987. Right. So right. they go from being like 18 pages or 20 pages to being 22. So less ads, a little bit more room. So what are we going to do with those extra two pages? Um, in this case, you know, they're going to add in more to the story. And with classic X-Men, it's an even longer issue because they have these backups, these John Bolton and Chris yeah. Claremont backups. Right. That would sometimes even spill over onto the back cover or the inside back cover, which was always really odd. <laughs> um, in this case, I, there's I remember loving some of those, yeah. and uh, you know, others not so much, but yes. 
Yeah, they were a bit hit and miss, but the ones yeah. that hit were really good. Well, and you get extra art too, right? Because sure. on the inside front cover, we've seen some Mignola art, Jason. Yeah. We've seen some Arthur Adams stuff, like just just bonus art. Yeah, they were, they really were like an enhanced version, in a way. You could you could tell which pages were additional, and you could ignore them if you wanted. Um, but just just to add one more in here, in the Alpha Flight version, before the fight happens, or sorry, before they go, uh, before they venture and the scene we're about to read like this panel down at the bottom we're going to see but wolverine putting his suit on and having a smoke oh in his room like yeah i like that as a walking fire hazard of course it's not going to hurt him but still yeah. it really um, shows how iconic some of these early burn claremont x-men issues became was that you could later refer to them from a different point of view yeah and readers would know what you were talking about. You'd be like, oh, this is the part where Wolverine comes down the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's down the stairs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Jason's asking, did Pierre Trudeau show up yet? Spoilers. <laughs> uh, he's not in this issue. He shows, shows up, up in, I believe, Alpha Flight number one. He, he actually shows up in X-Men 110. What? Really? Or maybe I'm wrong. Or you mean Wait, 120? He shows, up, he shows up the next time. No, One, it's 120. 120. My apologies. It's 120. All right. Boom. But he's not in this one. So no, he's sorry, Jason. <laughs> okay. But he does show up in 120. So there's something happening. They're expecting Wolverine to stay stationary for two hours. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's not a stationary man. Do you want to flip away? Yep. There we go. Scene shift. Yeah, Nightcrawler on the phone. Uh, to those out there who are uh, young, that's a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a cord. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And those phones were so rock solid that you oh. could murder oh. a person by yes. swinging that thing. People, I'm sure yeah. did murder people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've seen it in many movies. Yeah. Exactly. Um, my father has a chipped tooth that's been corrected, but from the just from the handpiece, the handset. My mother tried to pass him the phone in the middle of the night. At least that's what the story is. She yeah. tried to hear the phones for you, and she moved the handset toward him and knocked a tooth. Phones for you, Stan. Yeah, Those yeah things, that's yeah, were, were heavy and would hurt. Yeah. <laughs> At least I think that's what the story is. I better fact check that one. So Wolverine is sorry. Nightcrawler set up a date with Amanda. He's yeah. very excited, teleporting in the house, and again, like that version of his Banff is like just quintessential. Um. I feel like Michael Golden would do the same kind of, or Art Adams would draw the same kind of Banff. Peter's busy drawing. I wish his he's tongue was sticking he's out. He's writing a letter. Or writing, he's, sorry. He's writing a letter, yeah. I wish his tongue was out, like, above the, coming from the <laughs> bottom up, you know? Yeah. Anyways. And Nightcrawler used to be fun. Like, yes. this was a thing. I kind of lost track of superhero comics, for the most part, in about the yeah. mid-90s, when Nightcrawler was still this, like, fun, acrobat, swashbuckler character. Mm -hmm. And then I was really bummed when he showed up in the movies and was all, like, mopey and religious. And uh, what what happened to Nightcrawler? Does anybody know? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Was it just uh, kind of dark 90s took him? New writers looking for I, I, added depth. Hey, Jason, in, in the one episode that Nightcrawler shows up in the '90s animated series, right? Uh, he's more than one, but yeah. Oh, it's more than one. But so, what what version of Nightcrawler do we get in that? Mopey religious. Mopey religious Nightcrawler. Yeah. Monastic. I'm going to call him monastic. monastic. That's a good version. description. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would like honestly, I researched to get that today. He is, he is so much mopey. fun in these books. Yeah. He is <laughs> an absolute fun. joy. Speaking I, of Mopey, here's Cyclops. Oh, I wrote down Mopey Scott. Like, that's what I wrote yeah, down. Yeah. Mopey Scott. You know? Yeah. He's, uh, he's also, and also, sorry, these panels, Creepy Scott watching I, yeah. right from the window pane. Jeez. I always wanted to like Cyclops because he totally. looks so cool. Like, he's got the cool uniform that's basically just a silhouette with the goggles. And, like, he, he looks cool. But, man, what a wet sock. Like, he's just, just awful. <laughs> Hi, Nightcrawler. Yeah. Am I, I have a name. intruding, my friend? Uh, no, of course not. Do you have a pulse, my friend? <laughs> Barely. Yeah, he's not the most exciting character in these comics, that's for sure. But Nightcrawler is great. He's so I we've said you know every month or every week now, Chris. Yeah. Nightcrawler, Colossus, and Storm are so much fun. 
and they are just like they're really lovable characters they're, and they yeah. endear themselves to each other within the fiction and to the reader every single issue it's it's really it's demonstrably a new a new uh, approach to team-based books at yeah. least that i'm aware of um certainly just when i think of you're right the joy and we talk about this like the joy that comes from storm colossus and nightcrawler uh, the joylessness from Cyclops. Yeah. Wolverine turns into a fun character because he becomes this other thing. Right. But but the yeah. joy of the trio is, uh, I mean, is there a comparable on any team book, like Avengers or whatever? Yeah. Justice, like, there's no joy. Yeah, like, it's really fun, fun. In, in the Avengers at this time. You know, yeah. George Perez and John Byrne. Um, Avengers, yeah. Beast brings yeah. a lot of that, a lot of the fun to it. Okay. I really like just the storytelling here. And yes. those middle three panels where we see Nightcrawler and Scott creeping and watching Jean tell her parents what's happened to her. We don't get to hear what they're saying, yeah. but you can see from the body language of the parents and from Jean that she's really expressing this, you know, this trying to put into words this thing that's happened to her. And I'm like, yeah, her mother is not. I, it's it's, it's this traumatic, is, right? This is the exact sequence I wanted to talk about because it's okay. like nine out of ten other comic book artists move our point of view outside to see the Phoenix powers flare up because right. it's going to, it's going to look cool, but, and I don't know if this is Claremont or if it's burn. Right. I, sus I suspect it's John burn because we're working Marvel style here. Um, keeps the integrity of the point of view. This scene is about Cyclops feeling like an outsider. Yeah. And so we're keeping the viewpoint outside of that, of that conversation and what's going on outside. And uh, and that's impressive. Like a lot of people love John Byrne because his art looks cool. I mean, it's consistent with Marvel House style of the time, but just a little more stylized and a little more appealing. And and you know, there's lots of reason to love the way John Byrne draws. But he is also, you know, especially for the time, a storyteller of the highest order. Mm. And there are, you know, like this, this issue is just going to get silly with people kicking each other into trees and stuff, but it's told really well. Right. And, and these three panels are a really great exercise in, uh, you know, how comics like a well-directed movie can keep a consistent and thoughtful point of view. And I just like, I love this kind of stuff. I think this is why people love John Byrne even if they don't know it's why sure. they can't burn. I think that's a good point. Um, I I really like also that uh, the idea that Nightcrawler doesn't move like everybody else does. Yeah. You you know, you have these characters that, that are, again, they're abstractions of real people. They are, uh, if, if you have them all move the way they probably really would, it's not interesting to look at. But they have one character, he's, crouched he's he's shadowy like no one would come up behind you in the chair like that put a hand on the top of the chair and kind of whisper around yeah to talk to you like, be like we, I, I can feel your breath on my ear on this spread Fuck where off. nightcrawler is basically in silhouette yeah and it's hey it's cool it is <laughs> and it's 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 really in character and kind of describes his powers and exactly you know, without having movie to movie read that. about him or read his file you get a sense of like this is how this character moves yeah this, this tells you about who this person yeah. is in an interesting and oh. I iconographic way for a kid yeah you know i think it's neat Absolutely. Um, as trevor one six shooter is saying yeah you wanted to be nightcrawler for sure he yeah. wasn't he wasn't the freak that you uh, were disturbed by he was either you wanted to be him or have him as your best friend totally he was he was so much fun yeah Comic relief look very cool. weird yeah all right very cool and what you're gonna see here just on the nightcrawler uh, oh look at that john travolta and farrah fawcett by the way um that that roots us in an era that mm, holy very... cow look at that <laughs> and the amigos and then the amigos five um, posters for two dollars Woo! That's a deal, friends. It's a deal. <laughs> um, and then I was going to say, like, uh, it, it continues. It starts in the previous page and goes on to this first page. But what we get, or at least what is happening, uh, as we talked about the joy in these characters. But the other thing that's happening, I think, with Nightcrawler, that at least certainly that's something I'm, I'm observing just reading through these, is he's becoming, or he is, like, he becomes the voice of reason for the X-Men. He becomes their, or he is kind of, he kind of acts a bit as their moral compass. 
a bit of that, that conscience of the team. Um, now, I don't know if that's something that continues, but it seems very much like that's the role. Uh, yeah, a little comic relief, too. That was a good point as well. But also, like, he seems to be the one that, you know, actually, he he gets it. He gets relationships. He gets humanity, possibly because of the way he looks. And that's, like, the trade-off, and that's the characterization. But that's this thing that seems to be coming through very strong. Hmm. I'm looking at those those top panels and, like, how much more boring they are all of a sudden. Right. Especially the, the top right. Uh, where Scott and Kurt are just talking and Kurt's just behind him. Like that's an opportunity to, I guess you got to mix it up, but that's what I mean about how it would look if it was boring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like Nightcrawler's not really doing much with his body language and neither is Scott to kind of tell us where they're at, but I get that you, sometimes you can't handle it with every single panel, but there you go. And then uh, to move the story along, Banshee comes in and is like, Hey, let's go. We're having a picnic and let's get going. And the gang's yeah. all ready. But something different happens. It's five. I'm coming along. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And l- like this is the first time we're seeing uh, Burn draw this costume. Remember, yeah. it was blown up last time. So you get that big fat belt. I think that buckle. Yeah. Oof, yeah. Oof, awesome. Definitely the seventies. Um, yeah, and seventies <laughs> were all about wide belts. <laughs> <laughs> I read that mask as a helmet. Yes. Yeah. Right. Definitely yeah. seems solid. It's awesome. Right. And this is not <laughs> this is not the first time we're seeing Wolverine without his mask, right? We've no, seen no. Cockrum did. Yeah. Yes, Cockrum had a chance. And this is still very much the Cockrum version yeah. with the Widow's Peak. So, you know, Cockrum drew the Widow's Peak almost between the eyebrows. It was ridiculous. Like, yeah. like uh, oh, Count Floyd or... Um, yeah, Count Floyd. Right. Uh, yeah. Frankenstein? Uh, Frank- Frightenstein? Where it comes right down. No, the right. Hilarious, house, right. hilarious House of Frightenstein. Yes. <laughs> um, but the Widow's Peak is a little long or a little low here, but it still is rooted in the Cochran version, which he'll abandon bit by bit. But yeah. uh, just, again, the proportions, how stout he is. Uh, I, I love it. And this idea that, yeah, he's coming because he wants to go hunting. And Storm is thoroughly disgusted. She, he would take the lives of innocent animals, not for survival, but merely for sport. And here he goes. Listen, you. <laughs> Even if I would, Broad. Oh my God. What yeah. flaming business is it of yours? I said yeah. hunting, honey bunch. Flame well, that's, oh, honey bunch makes it better. I sure. said nothing. I said hunting, honey bunch. I said nothing about killing. It takes no skill to kill. What takes skill is sneaking up close enough to a skittish doe to touch her. <laughs> Wolverine, I'm aroused. Yeah. Jeez, Wolverine. <laughs> this is this is uh, <laughs> slightly good. sexual. Wolverine, I'm I'm sorry, I misjudge you. I could care less, Roro. You've all been misjudging me since the day I joined this turkey outfit. <laughs> I love how he slams his own team all the time. <laughs> this turkey outfit, you bunch of jokers. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really interesting. Just this, he, he. This is the first time that he is written as if. He could be misjudged. He was written one dimensionally up until yeah. this point. And this is like, yeah, I'm actually, I'm not a, a savage animal. I just want to touch a deer or a doe. Yeah. <laughs> just deer. could you let a man touch a deer? And uh, I think that's, that's actually kind of neat that that's what he's into. But why does he have to wear his costume? This, you know why. Yeah. Comics. But you know, that's, that's what I actually was going to say too is that up to this point, he's absolutely one dimensional. And we talked yes. about being on the cover and all these things. Is this the start of, of, and even in this, that three panel sequence, you've always misjudged me, you know, blah, blah, blah. he's still like super gruff, but it's that idea that, oh, there's more here. There's more here. And we're going to show you there's more. Yeah. So Byrne is the creator of Alpha Flight. Claremont gets these co-creator nods because he's the, the scripter and, you know, the writer of these issues, but the inspiration from Alpha Flight comes from Byrne. So... Right. Yeah, this is like a kind of a burn co-plotted issue, whether yeah. he's credited that way or not. Um, and I love the Star Wars crew, right? Oh, is this yeah, right. The helmets, right? Yeah. Death Star Gunners, Death Star, yeah. I think Death Star uh, Gunners. It could be yeah. a Death Star Gunner. It also could be. Um... <laughs> I, 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 I love, and I loved when I was a kid. This bottom panel of the yeah, the secret Canadian. <laughs> Uh, you, you yeah, know, uh, team moving in, and like it doesn't seem to be being played for laughs, which 
you know, we're all used to kind of American media where any hint of Canadian anything is, is, <laughs> is you know, is, is played as uh, kind of pure silliness. Like, I, uh, you know, I, I, I like that, you know, he's back there. He's all shadowy. He's a bit menacing. It's why yeah. I don't like those yeah. additional pages from classic X-Men because it kind of yes. it it feels this to reveal. Totally. It's uh, a like, yeah. yeah. Just I a loved flash. this when I was a kid and I love it now. Yeah, yeah, me too. Just a flash action figure here. There yeah, you go. Yeah, man. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> yeah. This is like a, a guy on the Alderaan yeah. on uh, the Tanti 5. Is that what it's called? Or is that the four? first ship that gets boarded? Yeah, this is a character from that scene. Uh, but that it's that helmet, right? Like yeah, it's, it's helmet. ridiculous yeah. and chin strap and everything. And, and Star Wars is brand new when this issue is being made, right? Yes, and they reference and they, it in the comic. It. Yeah. It's coming up. Just yeah. to just to give a shout out though, this is not a vintage Kenner figure. This is a custom, a custom. from uh, I've already forgotten who it was. A guy in uh, uh, Singapore. I've forgotten who. I should look it up. But uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, custom. Just because uh, they they should have made these figures, right? Like totally. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they should have. Uh, I love action figures. Moving on. <laughs> so one, one thing about that panel, that bottom panel too, um, I, I did take a look. So on his arm. It says shield with right. the Canadian flag. Yeah, so right. I'm guessing that's the Canadian shield, like the reference to the you know ge the geological right. formation in Northern Ontario. Okay, but it's not shield. Like it's not shield Canada. Like that. We're not missing out on something here. Are we? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Okay. Um, I had I had that same question. That's interesting. Yeah. It says that in the Alpha Flight issue that they are on. A commandeered shield ship. Hmm. I'm just looking for the exact. Okay, so Heather sort of says. Uh, Meanwhile, Mac and Cody, Cody being uh, James McDonald Hudson's sort of right hand man administrator, with several technicians, were already over American airspace in a commandeered sh in commandeered shield equipment. Now, if they're in commandeered shield equipment, why would they actually wear a shield logo? Right. Great question. There isn't an answer for that. So okay. this is where that you can use or get a classic Marvel no prize. Or if you can come up with a reason that they are wearing a shield armband when they are in commandeered shield equipment, um, are you suggesting that the Canadian Shield is a I'm, branch of Shield? I'm suggesting that maybe actually creatively that might have been one of the names they wanted to run with instead of Department H. And that it just stayed on the art and was never removed. Hmm. That's I don't know. That's what I think. Let's let's write to John Byrne and ask him. Okay. <laughs> All right. So they're going to intercept shortly. I need to get to that page and read ahead too because I haven't. Uh... There we go. Here oh, he is, dude. Here this... he is. Yeah. Bursting from the ground. Right. That's he comes you... from the ground. Right. That's how you sneak up on somebody. Right there. So How did he get in the ground. In, pop out of the ground. In um, in the comic and the Alpha Flight version, they, the they show it. They show him go under. Oh, really? They but show it, it? Really? They do. Uh, here, it's really uh, anticlimactic. I shouldn't build it up in any way. I have to. I'm flipping between multiple comic books here. It's uh, not that cool. Here we go. You ready? And uh, there. Oh, he like dives down. He dives he like, down. He does like a swan dive. Yeah. Into then, the ground. And when I saw that, you know, that picture. So he's like tunneling underneath? <laughs> I think that's how I'm going to read it too. Because okay. he's not in the forest in that, like the same spot where right. he comes across Logan eventually. When I saw that picture, I the lost emergence. my mind. I was already a fan of the character. Just yeah. in, again, posthumously. Um and when I saw that picture, I was like, that is the greatest drawing I had ever seen. And I right away took out a piece of newsprint and started drawing that thing. I copied it as best I could. I remember trying to like figure out why there were black muscles. Like I didn't get it. Right. And doing black colored pencil over my red colored pencil to try and get that effect. And figuring out, like, depending which one I draw first and how hard I have to push to make it look like black ink. Because I didn't know what it was ink. I didn't know they like that they ink comics. Um, yeah, I drew that, and I was so excited to show my friends. Like, look, look what I drew. <laughs> They're like, you made that. I'm like, yeah, I made that. 
that's a guy I made. What an intro, though, right? It is. It's yeah. awesome, and it's so it's evil. Like he is the villain in this moment. Yeah. He's the Canadian villain. Um, it looks amazing, and I can't still figure out from a drawing point of view how you draw black on the face of Weapon Alpha. Like I, I don't know how you how you make the choice of the rendering it that way, putting it in shadow. Um, yeah, it it looks it, great. It it does look great, and it pulls your eye there, right? Yeah, like solid solid blacks draw the eye, which is the only reason I can think of why he's doing it. Um, but yeah, it, it totally works. What's the logic though? Is there like is there any art logic from a lighting point of view? No, that... I don't think it makes any sense as lighting. Right. Like I say, I think it only makes sense as kind of a, you know, like a you know up 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 here, I, eyes up here, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, that, yeah. that does make sense to me um yeah. it looks so cool i uh, i also just to compare early vindicator uh, weapon alpha versus later it later gets to be like that the, the nose piece is sort of f flat or like the whole thing is it's sort of like a rounded dome where there isn't a protrusion of his nose right. if you look at the top panel on the next page it doesn't look like the nose sticks out as much as, uh, like there's. It doesn't look like there's a huge difference between the brow and the nose. It's sort of maybe one. I don't know. I don't know if this if this mask works in 3D. I just know I love looking at it from every time John Byrne draws it. Yep. Recognize me, Weapon X. <laughs> I love it. James yeah, McDonald yeah. Hudson at your service. I have time to say three names before we fight. <laughs> you although, have three names. <laughs> yes, although these days better known as Weapon Alpha. Yeah, man. And to think about what a big deal Weapon X as a as an institution within the Marvel comics, like what a big deal the Weapon X program is, and to think he's he's in it in a way. Like Weapon Alpha is a thing. Weapon X is a thing. Are they? It's all so unclear, and none of it was pre-planned, right? They're all just making it up as they go. Sure. But they're part of this same cool, mysterious past. Uh, I love it. I really do. Yep. And then if you take this panel, the next one, where Wolverine's lounging out of context, and just like, it's, <laughs> like draw a beer into his hand or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks really good. Oh, boy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll read a little bit. Here we go. Vacation's over, Wolverine. Control doesn't know what you've been doing in the States and they really don't care. They just want you back sexually. And I've been yeah. sent to get you. <laughs> Do tell. I resigned, Jimmy boy. And cut my ties and chastens. I'm a free agent now. No way I'm going back for you or for anyone. I love it. Oh my God. Fight, 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 fight. Yeah, man. <laughs> And then again, there's a reference to Giant Size Number One, which again, yeah. like I, I was so happy that I had the uh, classic X Men version. You always were a royal pain in the butt, Logan. Short and arrogant and feisty as your namesake. It's time you learn some manners, Pip Squeak. Like <laughs> g getting called this stuff should not hurt anyone's feelings. No, you're gonna call me Pip Squeak, really? Okay, that's cute. I don't know. But I love the pictures. I really, I, I just adore the. It's the... it's really great banter. Like it's <laughs> it, it is. I know it's silly, but it's incredibly. I don't know. It works so well. Like for the these two characters and their their relationship and history, and then their fight. Yeah, and you think you're man enough to teach teach him, <laughs> right? Jimmy, 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 <laughs> Bub, where I come from, which is where you come from, which is where we both come from. Them's fighting <laughs> words. I love it. I love it. Yeah, man. And then seeing Wolverine land a punch and like it makes sparkles. Yeah, man. And Wolverine never backs off from a fight. It's a good thing he got his shield up in time. Good totally. Whew, barely. And we um we really haven't had someone react to Wolverine in the comics in a way that made Wolverine seem to be interesting. Like he's his violence is kind of played for laughs a lot of the time, or it gets dismissed, yeah. or he gets knocked out of panel. But yeah. this is the first time we actually see only two characters in a fight in the issues that we've read uh, with this degree of intensity and have Wolverine be one side, but get to hear the thoughts of the other person who has like respect for Wolverine's abilities. It's not just, Oh, get this animal away from me. It's like, Oh my God, good Lord. 
<laughs> he's even, he's, even uh, he's faster than than ever, and I barely got my shields up in time. Yeah. First move to you, Logan. You throw a punch as good as ever. Let's see how well you take one. Oh, sir, I got ahead. On my page, it's there. You got ahead. Sorry. Um, um, the spoilers. I'm going to say still to this oh, day. Yeah, Clark Bar ad. That's I, <laughs> <laughs> pizzazz. Yeah, I remember pizzazz. With the drawing of Stan Lee, right? Yeah. And I was mentioned before, like his neck and his the like, look how beefy. Beefy yeah, I like his Stan shirt. Lee. Hey, kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is the hardest punch I can think of in a superhero comic, maybe other than Dark Knight Returns. Like that, yeah. that is. It has everything that a right cross yeah. or whatever kind of punch that is. That is a great drawing of a punch. Oh my yeah. God. I love it. I was, yeah. Yeah. It, the way the left hand is poised too. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I, that, that punch stays with me. Every time I draw a punch, I try to avoid copying this, but it's right. all, all that's in my head. But you're thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know what, Jason? Any time we do punches, which is every fifth panel in our books, uh, <laughs> I just, I doesn't matter. Just do this punch every time, over and over and over. Again. I love it. I really, I think about it like constantly. This, this yeah. really has stayed with me over the over the decades. Yeah. Um, set up such a great mystery about Wolverine, and I instantly wanted to know everything about Weapon Alpha, and I am still in the same place. And everything I learned about Weapon Alpha from here on, Trevor, has been a disappointment to what was in my head. <laughs> as the potential of what this dynamic could have been. You know, every writer who wanted to put their mark on it never was able to make it live up to what what this probably could have been in our heads, you know? Really, really special. What a, yeah, that punch. Definitely. Yeah. I do all right, bub. I do all right. I do pretty good with taking punches, but yep. you're forgetting the old days, Jimmy boy. <laughs> Can we call people that kind of thing again? Can yeah. Start? No matter how hard you hit me, I'll keep coming back. Big talk, Logan. That's his inside voice. Yeah, what does his inside voice say? Like? Big talk, Big Logan. Talk, Logan. <laughs> 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 yeah, I always wondered though, like when when Wolverine punches this battle suit with his claws, does his hand bounce off? Like, does it go through a force field slowly? Like, what what is the I, I'm trying to what the dynamic would be like. Is it like lightsabers hitting stuff? Um, I, am, it, I never really was sure. It's neat. Anyway, moving on. Mm -hmm. Despite our size difference, I was always better at everything than Jimmy. But that glowing suit he's wearing. Oh, oh cripes. You can fly. Yeah, oh, oh cripes. You can fly. <laughs> How perceptive, groundhog. Come on, guys. Leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, and then as he's flying at him at top speed, he has time yeah. to say all of this. My <laughs> battle suit is the ultimate product of Canadian technology. Oh man, you guys have to do that to us. Now <laughs> I feel like ugh, they don't put the spotlight on the ultimate Canadian technology. It's like yeah. this is a a donut maker, maple syrup dispenser. What are we? What joke oh, are we man. making here? Um, yeah, its powers combined with my training make me the equal of any technology. Avenger. Yes. Yeah. Prove it, Jimmy boy, because till then Jimmy you're Jimmy. all mouth. I really like the coloring on this bottom left panel. Yeah. Where, you know, they've kind of muted Wolverine in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to let the uh, highlight be on, uh, on Weapon Alpha. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's smart. Like even with the old 64 color palette or whatever it is. Uh, you know, you could, uh, you know, you could, you could pull off some effects, lead the reader's eye around. That's what totally. it's all about. If, and, yeah. Uh, when, I, when I saw that panel, I stopped for a minute and was like, yeah, you know, that, that, do we remember who the colorist was on this issue? Cause, uh, they, they, they seemed like they knew their business. <laughs> I'm taking a look. Yeah. The colorist is, I don't know how to pronounce it. Andy Yankus. Sure. Yankus. Or Yankus? I mean, uh, Andy Yankus. I don't know. Yeah. Yankus? No, I don't know how to pronounce it. No comment. No comment. Yep. Um, but yeah, there you go. It's, it's you know, they have a really quick deadline to turn these things around from the coloring point of view. It's tedious work. Yeah. But these little things they do to make it more dynamic and add to the storytelling. Like, obviously, there isn't a huge orange flare around the punch in real yeah. life. 
but it really adds to the tension of the moment. You know, totally. Yeah. And then you pick a different kind of color for the the sound effect. Yeah. You know, something that's going to pop out against everything else that's there. Yeah. All these little choices are great. Yeah. You really can't think of coloring as too literal. It's really got to, yeah, it's really got to lead the eye and add to the storytelling and all that stuff. Um, one quick comment about Max uh, costume. Sometimes there's that part all the way down the leg and I just keep thinking about Cooper Alls. <laughs> it's a reference for my buddy Chris Sanigan, hockey fan. Scott, I don't know what your, what your dynamic is with hockey. I am like I'm I'm a bad Canadian in that respect, and that I don't really care about hockey. Did you ever? No. Okay. So <laughs> do you remember when you were a kid? For a little bit, sometimes hockey players had full length pants. I wore pants instead yeah. of socks. Yeah. So the brand from Cooper was called the Cooper All. Okay. And you know, like the Philadelphia Flyers when Daryl Sittler got traded. I'm trying to make a reference that you can connect to here. Yeah. Um, when Sittler got traded to the Flyers the flyers wore a full length black pant. Okay. And it had the white stripe down the side. So whenever I see like this costume that, that weapon yeah. alpha is wearing, I just think he's wearing uh, Cooper alls. Hockey pants. Yeah. yeah hockey, it's, it's hockey weird. Pants. Like it's a cool design in so many ways, mm -hmm. but like, what do, you, what do you do with the stem of the maple leaf? Do you, you end it at the waist? Down? Do you like, what do you, what do you do? You well, give you him sexy white legs. From this angle. But yeah, what do you what do you do with the stem? Do you just make it super long? Who knows? <laughs> well, Burn Burn knows at that moment he's yeah, like super long because he's thinking about long, yeah. Cooper Alls. Yeah, and I have the Marvel Legends action figure of of this character in in the room. Does I, it have the Cooper Alls? Hold on, you guys talk. Hold on, we're gonna find out. I, I'm gonna say uh, as he goes and retrieves his figure. All uh, right, that last panel on page 22 when when he goes right through him. Right, <laughs> that is. Just, it's just legs. It's four it legs. Is. Yeah. It okay. Is. So what? What's going on with this figure? I'm really unhappy with the red. Okay. It's yeah. like look. I want the black. I want. You the want black. a deeper? Yeah. You want a deeper red that suggests the black. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so this a, leg is bare white. Right. The right. stem just goes. Yeah. Oops, sorry. The, the stem, stem just there. ends where it would on the flag. Yeah. And then this leg has the. Oh. As it does in the comic, yeah. Okay. Um, this looks really lame the way I'm posing him, but it, it's a cool figure. Except, uh, yeah, I think here, the red's pretty. Hold on, hold on. I don't know if you can see the mouth, it's really like. Nah. Nah. <laughs> it's very dour. It's very dour. Yeah. And then the nose is just Batman, right? It's uh, interesting yeah. that they gotta like outline the eyes so that they read as. Yes. White eyes. Otherwise, it's just a completely white head. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to maybe take a paintbrush to this. Do it and do and do some. Thanks, Scott. Extend you, that. Yeah. You don't care about my action figure collection. Extend that stem. <laughs> All right, back to the fight. Uh, well, we we end the fight ends could be kind of. because while well, Weapon Alpha goes right through him. Yes. Um, and then we then we have the nice the nice swimming um, interlude. Where can I say can I say about this panel? One of my big pet peeves about comic book artists is that they always draw the uh, like ground outside flat. I don't know if a lot of comic book artists ever even go outside, but the ground outside is not flat. So, so one one of the things I appreciate about this top panel on page uh, twenty is it twenty three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not flat. It's uh, it's it's refreshing. John Byrne has clearly been outside once or twice. <laughs> oh, huge, uh... huge pet peeve of mine. Yeah, I better yeah. go look at my stuff. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Chris, do you want to read uh, any of this? Or no? uh... I've been reading a lot. <laughs> I think we're okay. <laughs> All right. I think so we're there's, okay. I there's mean, some, it's... yeah. There's some flirting going on in the water. Yeah, man. Yeah. And uh, and then there's some like good character development between you know the bond between Peter and Aurora. Yep, it's nice. Peter has yeah, muscles like, upon muscles. Yeah, like Chris Claremont. I don't know how old Chris Claremont was when he was writing this, but he's clearly. I know he was newish to writing comics, but he's clearly like not a lot happens in this issue plot wise, 
but he's clearly starting to figure out the idea of theme. Like the X-Men are coming home. Jean Grey's parents are there. Peter's writing a letter to his parents. Guardian is coming, or Weapon Alpha, whatever we're calling him now, is coming to take Wolverine home. Storm's, right. talk, Storm's talking about her home where she gets to be naked all the time. And, and, and Peter is like, oh, in my home, it's all flat and I fix tractors or whatever. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> like, clearly this issue is being built around that theme of like, home, home, home. And like I said, like half of it is superheroes kicking each other around a lake. But um, th there's some thought being put into it here in yeah. terms of in, in, in terms of thematic stuff. And, and Claremont's mm -hmm. only going to get better at that as, sure. as, as things go along. It, it's also a great. Uh, that last panel on that page being like a real great interrupting panel to the nice moment. Right? Like, right. hey, yeah. you, whoa, Wolverine just got through to it, thrown into a tree. Yeah. <laughs> I also like that he was miles away. Oh, and he was. They miles just away. happened to come back to this spot, which is one of my biggest pet peeves in uh, <laughs> in these kinds of stories, whether it be movie or television show or comic, is when characters uh, go up into the sky or fight really far away but end up on the exact block either where yeah. they started they always or, land right where they need to yeah <laughs> you know if, if if my understanding of the orbiting earth or the rotating earth has taught me anything if you go up into space and then you come straight back down you're not in the same spot as, right. you, as you took off from yeah so uh yeah but the fact that that um mac punches and fights wolverine back to the spot where his uh overpowered friends are is a good comic book coincidence, but it needed to happen. Yeah, it's just unfortunate for a, a longer, a longer beating. You would have just, what was he going to do to Wolverine? Just beat him to unconsciousness and take him away? Sure, because sure. he beat him to unconsciousness. So take him away, dude. Don't don't engage. What is he going to so, do? Speaking of engaging, he's going to engage. <laughs> he's like up. Oh. And I love that the, the two X Men to get he ready. He calls for the witnesses. Like, what was he going to do? Like, <laughs> right. Right? like yeah. witnesses yeah. suggest something else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this reminds me back to Scott's your comment about the coloring. Like, Wolverine yeah. is tinted green again. He's like being muted just mildly out of the focus. Right. So we're paying attention to the other three characters on the move. And he's sort of in the shadow of the tree a little bit, but it's, yeah, muted in the foreground. Looks really good. Yeah. yeah. Stay out of this, you people. <laughs> My business is with Weapon X. Nice. Wolverine is our friend. Thank you. <laughs> if you want him costumed one. <laughs> yeah. go, go on, do the Count Dracula. <laughs> no, I'm done. I, I said what I needed to say. Like, who is this bruiser? His Russian, uh, his accent sounds uh, Transylvanian. Transylvanian. That's a fun, though, that three, the transformation. Oh, yeah. Thing. Yeah, man. That's, that's super fun. And then just the, the, the obviously the, the impact of the punch is the sound effect crom. I really like <laughs> crom by crom. <laughs> the I think this is one of the biggest selling points of X Men comics yeah. is the as as Trevor is saying the the personal non costume stuff yeah. that Claremont does really well. Watching them in their regular lives and when their regular lives intersect with their powers and sort of some of the problems of being a superhero. It, it's so much fun and it really made it much more real than the idea that like, oh, we're going to meet on Mount Olympus. We're going to get into our costumes before we get there. And we're just going to go from Mount Olympus or the justice league watchtower, meaning the same thing Yeah. Uh, to this location that we're being told to go to. No, like we're, we're living with these characters, you know, and yeah. seeing them in the, their various um, states throughout the day. And yeah, this transformation, well, yeah. Yeah, it makes you care, right? Like totally. So when they're when they're in danger and getting kicked into trees, you uh, uh, you know you you care about what happens to them. Yeah, that uh, that transformation is awesome. Yeah, and there I was mentioning to you before, Chris, about the um, Kirby Crackle, and like how Burn okay. iterates on it. Yeah, he, he does this different different you know more abstract shape, but they kind of have a, a movement to them, mm -hmm. like they kind of swell and and. And sail in a particular direction, but it is still from that the, the genesis of the Kirby Crackle for sure. It almost reminds me of the side of a pencil, 
Like he oh, does, yeah. he uses, you know, we have the benefit of seeing Burns pencils now in X-Men terms with those bootlegs that, uh, that we got our hands on kind of, yeah. but Burns shared burn has been, um, to the, the couple people who, you know, are going to see this after the fact, or who are here in the chat, John Byrne, after, uh, I guess a couple years ago, he started drawing X-Men comics from the point that he left the title. So issue 143 is his last one or 144. Like days of future past is the ending for mm -hmm. him. He leaves okay. the title and he decides for whatever reason that he was going to, he, he was in talks to do more X-Men with Marvel. And in the meantime, he just started drawing it and the talks never came to fruition. <laughs> so he has like 20 issues of X-Men comics that he's drawn um, that he's doing nothing with. So he decided just to release it on his website. Yeah. And people have downloaded, of course, and then uh, they've gone to printers and printed them off and shared them or sold them illegally. Um, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a really neat thing to see what he does. Cheers. Dragon Eye 69. Leave my toys alone. Thanks for hanging with us. Yeah. Have That's a good night. Life. Thanks for joining yeah. big time. Um, and Trevor says those bootlegs are excellent. I agree with you. They're really cool to see, but you, you get to see what, how he uses a pencil differently than what we see in, of course, ink form. So he is using the side often to make those kinds of effects, which is a neat deconstruction of uh, how he goes. Anyway, Crom. Crom. <laughs> and then uh, we get a Superman reference. The Man of Steel. Yeah, Man of Steel. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. There's a number of those. Okay, so I know I, I, we even mentioned it, but even on, on so if you've seen the Canadian Shield, Man of Steel, uh, the on, right on the front cover, he says, you know, Weapon Alpha always gets his man. That's the Mounties, right? That's, oh. that, that's yeah, classic, yeah, yeah, right. So you know they really do pepper a number of Canadianisms and Cooperalls and Cooperalls <laughs> into this issue. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Ladd, looks like you've got a fight in your hands, which is just fine with me. I warned you to stay out of this, Buster. Buster. See, he's our Cyclops. But you yep. wouldn't listen. Yep. Now you're going to pay the price. Canadian Cyclops. You <laughs> nailed it. I, I love the idea that you know he's trying out his battle suit for the first time. This is, you know, he's yeah. really quite powerful. He can do a lot. He's got well, a, a diverse he, power set. He goes pretty much toe to toe with the entire X Men. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. for lack of a better description, like that's how powerful this suit is, is he's yeah. able to go toe to toe with them. And it's skin tight. <laughs> and it looks amazing. He's ripped. <laughs> yes, he is. So yeah, Storm Power's up and uh, Wolverine's coming back online here. Or don't. Hudson's mine because I, I can totally do it. I can handle this guy. And she uh, yeah disintegrates that log in front of him or whatever mm -hmm. to school and um Mac throws his zap back right at her, banks it off of Colossus's teeth, and almost kills a bunch of nipple. Nipple. If you ever have to get into Russian character mode, it's just nipple. <laughs> and uh yeah, Moira McTaggart takes it across the temple, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, yeah, she does. And Which almost then, Nice. Yeah, more ads. Yeah, and then more which uh, nice panel from uh, of of Banshee hopping in the water. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about this panel because, uh, like, it it speaks again to John Byrne's storytelling ability, which again nine nine out of ten comic book artists drawing this are going to take a side view. They're, they're going to draw the leap into the water. Right. Burn kind of organizes this information in a way that we see kind of the foreground hand. We see what's at stake. We see Banshee's panic expression. You know, we still get the impression of the of the jump into the water. But like no word of a lie when you, Jason, when you told me what issue we were going to be talking about and that it was, uh, you know, the introduction of Weapon Alpha. And I was like, uh, oh, yeah, Moira falls into the water and Banshee jumps in. Mm. To, together like i remembered this panel right and, and i probably hadn't read like until last week i probably hadn't read this issue in 35 years right um, yeah like this this is the exact right 
arrangement of the important information here in a way that a could be read from across the street and b clearly really sticks yeah uh and and yeah there would certainly be kind of cooler ways to draw it but not necessarily better ways to draw it storytelling wise i really like i i remembered this panel he's That's... also got a, a lot to get through in two pages sure so yeah. it packs you know it, he's uh really economic about it definitely I, I love that open panel in the next one too um yep. just having those like if you were to finish the mm -hmm. lines and and make the 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 panel border it would just clutter it up just a fraction more not a lot yeah but just enough that having this open panel we don't need the trees in the background we don't need another sky shot we know where they are you know we, we don't need any more information and it, actually, yeah, and it, it gives us a sense of relief too right like she's out of the water now yeah it's a breath so yeah there's a yeah there's a certain we were holding our breath and then we're releasing it here i also have a soft spot for the yellow uh word balloons Right. When they do it in this on on these uh, open panels, I like that. Yeah, I do. I like yeah. the yellow board balloons, but that's just me. So, a quick thing about this, you know, she could have a concussion or worse. And if you want to read this for us, Chris, in your best Irish oh. brogue, Saints be praised. I <laughs> Saints be praised. I got her out in time. She's still breathing, but she's out cold, and there's a nasty burn across her forehead. She could have a concussion or worse. And ye made your my belief. Or whatever you call yourself, you're the man responsible. So that might be more new. No, there's the keep going, keep going. And if it costs yeah, more, me, I yeah. want to make you pay. I love it. I, I love that. It might have been more right? like Mark Critch, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but the, like just engaging Banshee again and putting his power set as being yeah. one of the most powerful people in the room. Um, it, it's nice because reading it in '87. You know, Banshee's no longer on the team. He was never a character I took seriously as a as an eleven year old. Yeah. Um, and to see him go like full out was always kind of awesome to put me back in check. But what I was gonna say is major main belief is that his like you just I don't even care what you call yourself. I'm making up a nickname here. Um, but Marvel doesn't let that rest. They like they pick up the scab and they make up a character called Major Maple Leaf. <laughs> Like, oh, fuck you guys. It's got to keep that trademark alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he shows up in a later iteration of Alpha Flight. Yes, he does. So Banshee goes charging uh, like a man possessed. And I love it. Mac, like, oh, yeah, I recognize him from an old Interpol flyer. That's awesome. He's going crazy. Liquefying. You know, his, his powers are liquefying whenever they hit. Like, that's awesome. And so he's like, I better get out of here. I love that he retreats. He does. Yes. He, I love that he does a strategic yes. retreat yes, where he yes. basically goes toe to toe with them all, gets a sense of all their power sets. His suit's still working well, but he's like, you know what? Only a fool would stay to fight super beans. He knows nothing about just out of pride. And James right. Hudson is no fool. It's like, that's right. No, that's great. It is good. I love it. Yeah, man. And then he does this really odd thing where he. he so in the Alpha Flight issue, they explain what he did. And I will, I'll just read you the science, okay? Because it's... Did he put his finger in his mouth and go... He put his finger in his mouth and did that. <laughs> um, Where did he go, Storm? I don't know. I saw him put his finger in his mouth. So it's neat because it's the rest of the page is like... Here, I'll just show you. Um, it was the same where the top two panels are that. And then the next right. one is that. Okay. And then him flying off. And okay. he's explaining what happened. And this is now not Claremont writing. It's, it's Burn. So... He oh, goes and he says, right, right. This is Alpha Flight, right? Because it's in, a, in the Alpha Flight comic. So it's, yeah. he's, he, he credits Claremont as the scripter in those middle block of pages, but it's, he's the overall storyteller. Right. He says, wow, first time I've tried that little trick, I knew it would work. I had no idea it would be such a wrenching experience. By using the gravity control of my suit, I was able to render myself at rest relative to the turning of the earth below me. That gave me instant velocity over a thousand miles an hour. I was a hundred miles due west before the X Men even knew I was gone. So he just froze his place in in the Earth's graphic, Earth's rotation, and yeah. the Earth kept turning, and he's just like he's gone. Right. Um, never. I don't remember him ever using that power ever again. But it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, man, that's uh. And he calls himself Jimmy Boy in his head another time. 
And then he says that he, you know, Alpha Flight, you know, he, he better, uh, you know, he mentioned before he's going to come back with Alpha Flight. He says that in the X-Men comic, I'll bring Alpha Flight with me. Here he says, Weapon Alpha has made a less than auspicious de- debut. Whatever else happens, there's an awful lot I have you know, to vindicate. Ooh, so we I, know we were, we were robbed of a of a now that he's gone uh, we were robbed of an elderly Christopher Plummer putting oh. on his, right putting on the right. suit being like right being like back when he was the first weapon alpha you know like we were robbed of that agreed yeah that's or great. Bill Shatner <laughs> come on the Shatner would be <laughs> come on is that a little too on the nose. <laughs> Heather. He'd be good too, but yes, yeah. he'd be a different good. You know? Baron Back Bacon would have been yes, a good Canadian. Uh, Marvel's probably filing a trademark on that right now. Baron Back Bacon. <laughs> um, what do, what do the X Men have to say at the, at the end of this issue here? What are they saying? Storm causes a big storm to see if he's anywhere near. Like to maybe he's, they think he's invisible or something. Yes. <laughs> you're not reading. You're like I'm not gonna. Oh, you're um, reading. Banshee and her take a look around to see that no, he's not. He's nowhere near. Yeah. Um, Wolverine signaling them back to the lake. Murray needs medical t- medical attention. Who is he? Why is he after you? He's and he says, you. "Once upon a time, PD, we were buddies, almost brothers." Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm real sorry, folks. Today's fracas was just the beginning because they're going to come back in eleven issues. Wolverine and, apologizes. And, another thing. Meeting. Yeah. And things are yeah. going to get worse. Good point. Um, totally. Yeah, it's like a just a different version of Wolverine, completely. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and a different version. And again, if you were reading this without having the the history of Wolverine, if this is coming to you fresh, to take the one character who is, you know, we've already said was like you know boring one dimensional character, and then suddenly have an issue where it's like, oh, there's a lot more going on here. Yeah, there's not just the history, yeah. but yeah. He, uh, the, the yeah, the way he wants yeah. to spend his afternoon yeah. off, and the way he, you know, he's feeling remorse. Just saying that they took in this in this edition, the classic X Men issue right. uh, sixteen, they've removed the what what comes next stuff at the bottom. Yeah, and someone's incorrectly drawn in new parts to Wolverine's costume <laughs> and Peter's Peter's legs. <laughs> sure, different. Oh yeah, if you look at back at what we were looking at, it's the stuff's not there. Yeah, it's covered. Wild. No weird. The gun. But they drew Wolverine's costume wrong. I mean, like, anyway. Yeah. And then, and then it seems like we get another page of uh, the Weapon Alpha going home. To, yes, to, to the, the Cure and Wire stuff, yeah. and it actually is sort of yeah. like him. Uh, he's sort of saying most of the stuff that Burn writes in the other yeah. version. I find that odd that like. Like, yeah, I find the new material really odd. Like he's suddenly a viewpoint character all of a sudden. Like, yes. I don't, like I don't, I don't find that that works very well. I, well, I think by the point, I, I yeah. agree with you. It doesn't work well. Yeah. Um, I see why they did it though, because at this time period, Alpha Flight is a, a good selling comic. Sure. Yeah. So they were like, we're gonna get, we're gonna double dip on the fan base. Yeah. How yeah. so on the in the history of that the Alpha Flight? How long did Alpha Flight sell well for? Before it, like till John Byrne left. So that's the I first. I was going to say as long as 18, Byrne was doing 18, it, right? 20 yeah. issues, twenty-eight yeah. issues, if memory okay. serves. And then, uh, strangely enough, uh, Bill Mantlo comes on with I want to say, shit, was it Mike Mignola, or just on covers for a bit? Mignola did a bunch of covers. There's I Mignola Alpha covers. Flight covers. There are Mignola yeah. Alpha Flight covers. Yeah. Yeah. Like around issue, like I said, you know, 29, 30, 31, 32, right around. Yeah, I got the new thing I got to look for now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and very early. Yeah, right. Well, so the Hulk, the the Hulk team and the Alpha Flight team swap. So okay. Burn oh. goes from Alpha Flight to Hulk, and the Hulk team. Uh, I'm trying to remember who draws that first issue where they, they're. Do you want to draw the draw draw the furry Hulk? We have a guy called Sasquatch. The story is Done. that they're trying to find a new body for Walter Lankowski for Sasquatch's consciousness to take because he's been inside of um, Box? a no. a uh, snowbird as a no. He ends up there. He's been inside Box 
the the robot armor for a few issues and they decided to put him into they like try and open up a nexus and right. you know find some sort of mindless beast inside of uh, a magical realm kind of thing yes and yes. it happens to be that the hulk is in a magical realm and he's like oh we've got one and so they pull him through and and his consciousness doesn't take and the hulk is there and he just starts smashing everything he shows up in alpha flight like 2829 and it's a it's a it's a fucking mess. So yeah. I'm trying to remember who the artist was on Hulk, but Mantlo's the writer, correct? Anyway, yeah. And from then on, like the series just stop, it loses its. I kept reading for another thirty or so issues, and then New Jim Lee comes and he joins. He comes on the title. It's his first I, Marvel work. I remember that. Yeah, Jim Lee's first Marvel work is Alpha Flight. Yeah. Alpha Flight. Yep. And it's good for you know. It was it was good. It was nice to look at. It's not the Jim Lee that you know we eventually see. Yeah. Um, he he turns into something special really fast, but it was some nice tight stuff. You know, it was cool. Either way, we're we're we've strayed real far. Um, what, how do we get onto that? Oh, what's um, it, the the fact that they have these additional pages? Yeah. Yeah, it is a, it is a weird choice. It doesn't work in terms of um, keeping the focus of what the issue should be about. You're totally right about that, Scott. Yeah. You're very grown up when you you point out these really obvious storytelling things. Thanks, man. <laughs> it is Mignola drawing those first couple issues. That's yep. crazy. I'm going to have to go get dig those out. Yeah. Dude. Jerry Talon? I don't even know who that is. That's sad. I, so this is I a really special... Yeah. A really special issue. Um, I The fight is so short between Wolverine and Weapon Alpha, but it l- left such an impression. Yeah, um, it's memorable. And... and uh... And Weapon Alpha is a pretty memorable character. He's uh, that that costume is amazing. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he definitely left an impression. I, I, I no surprise that you know they spun into Alpha Flight and then his own book and uh, and all that stuff. So they they he's here for five issues in X Men, right? He goes one hundred nine, one twenty, one twenty one, and then one thirty nine and one forty. Where um, I think Snowbird. And He's Mac. on, yeah, 109, 120, 121, and 139, 140. I just said that. Yeah, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just making sure you know. He's, He's And yeah. they come back and fight Wendigo at the end. Right. As, um, as a team up with Nightcrawler and Wolverine. And Wolverine's in the brown and tan for the first time. And I have that classic X-Men issue. Yeah, it's awesome. I only have like one or two, but that's one I have. It's really, really good stuff, too. The, the cover is amazing. Yeah, uh, the, the backup in this classic X-Men, by the way, that we just looked through is... A story about young Banshee, a motorbike oh, right. kind of incident, and he meets a. I want uh, the whole thing narrated by Chris Sanigan. Oh, with the Irish. <laughs> a toy, toy, toy. He reveals his power to a woman, and I think eventually, uh, maybe she, it's Siren's mom. Yeah. And uh, there's some Black Tom Cassie stuff that happens in it, and I know that's racist, but I said it anyway. Speaking about X Men voices, this is my X Men claim to fame. Is the guy who did uh, Chris Potter, the actor who voiced Gambit in the '90s cartoon, mm-hmm. okay, was sure. married to one of my high school art teachers? Wow! Yeah, so he was like, I, I was involved with like drama festival stuff all the time, and he would always come in because he was like a working actor. And uh, yeah, I met him. I met him a few times. So there you go. Did he do the voice? Uh, I don't. I do not remember him doing the Gambit voice to my <laughs> to my uh, memory. Sure. Yeah. Did you ever sit down with him and play cards and then he do his Gambit voice? <laughs> he <laughs> just, throw him, he just, just throw him at you. Is he Canadian? <laughs> he is Canadian. Cool. Um, also, oh, he's from. <laughs> Jason says he's from uh, Kung Fu: The Legend Continues. Yeah, that's right. He had a good few years there where he was. Was he the on lead a, actor on, on that on show? On a couple of shows that you that's would David Carradine. Yeah. No, not David. The the other guy. The younger yeah, guy is that? He? Yeah, the son, the son. I've seen him yeah. in tons of stuff. Oh yeah, he's he's yeah 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 yeah. He um, had a good, like I say, he had a good run for a few years. Is he coming back? You know, the X Men show's coming back, Scott. Yeah, uh, I don't know if he's coming back or not, but it'd be great. I think as much of the original cast as as possible is sort of like the 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 desire. Yeah. Really? What? I'm trying to bend this. Really? Thing. That's playing with your toys over there now. That's that's what I always say I'm doing. Yeah. No matter what, I'm actually I'm just playing with my toys. Yeah, um, I, know, I, know, I, I just Googled Chris Potter, Canadian actor. And yeah, uh, right. 100% know this dude is. Yeah, yeah. He was in Heartland later. He was yeah, in, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Kung Fu yeah. Legends for sure. Yeah. So he was the voice of Gambit, huh? Yep. 
I wonder if he was pulling from a Quebecois style accent as opposed to a Cajun right. for I would say, I would to say find Acadian. it. Acadian. Okay, well, He's going Acadian deep. is Cajun. That's where the word comes from, right? Yeah, I know, but it's Acadian first, and there's an expulsion of the Acadians. Yes, what year? 18th century. Oh, you're, you're so vague. Just saying, they get on yeah. ships. Does it, mm-hmm. We don't have to talk about that. It's a heritage minute. Look it up. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's a heritage minute. are awesome. Um, <laughs> I wanted Alpha Flight toys as a kid so badly. So yeah, I, I, oh. It was all I wanted. To be able to tell stories with these action figures. Uh, we can call it now. Next issue is 10, sorry, 110. I'm very excited for that. It is almost 11 o'clock. Scott, you've been on here with us for almost two hours. That is uh, officially the most time anyone is actually allowed to spend with us. <laughs> we, uh, For your own safety, there is a, a curfew. All right. This was, uh, this was a blast. I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if I can come back on the show when mm-hmm. Alpha Flight shows up again in issue 120. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, we're, let's we're, do it. we're working a series of guests and spots are getting taken very quickly. So I got I got a whoa, <laughs> like, Nelly. Who who you got that's not, uh, better than Scott Chandler? Better than? <laughs> uh, I'll ask your sons and All we'll, right. see, what, <laughs> we'll right. see what their response to that is. Better than dad? Uh, name them. Yes. All right. Uh, definitely we'll have you back without a doubt. Obviously. I would love to. Uh, yeah. Any uh, any any time I will come on and uh, and talk X Men with you dudes. How many how many glasses did you get through tonight? Just the one? Uh, I had two glasses of this excellent whiskey that you guys sent me for my birthday. I'm going to yeah. give, uh, give give a little plug here to uh, Junction 56. See if you can get them as a paid sponsor. And uh, <laughs> that'd be good. I got there. I got some stuff right here. Junction 56. No. <laughs> yeah, here we oh, go. No, you yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a, a, a way that people can find you online, Scott? I am just Scott Chandler everywhere. My website is scottchandler.com. I'm at Scott Chandler on Twitter. I'm at Scott Chandler on Instagram. Uh, yeah. The, are you, the, those are mostly the places. But are yeah, you, you off can, of Facebook? I am off of Facebook because it's awful. That's that's fair. I yeah. uh, In promotion, in the process of getting ready to promote this stuff today, I noticed that we were no longer friends on Facebook and I, I got sad. Yeah, I haven't been on Facebook for years. So I figured you, noticed, you just you, you hiding noticed from me. something from years ago. It's uh, <laughs> it's nothing personal, but no, it's uh, okay. Yeah, Zuckerberg can. Uh, yeah, he can suck it for walk sure. into the ocean as far as I'm concerned. Oof, oof. Yeah. And I know Instagram is kind of Facebook, but it's it's at least a little gentler. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. So we can find you at Scott Chandler on just about everything. Yeah, come come follow me all the places. And uh, what's the next event you're going to be at? Oh, um, fingers crossed for uh, TCAF. Um, I just I just uh, uh, pitched a few um, programming ideas uh, for TCAF 2022, which nice. we're all hoping will be in person. Um, I'm I'm going to be at London, Ontario Comic Con. So far, that's the only; those are the only two things that I think are are kind of for sure. But uh, yeah, hopefully the schedule is going to fill up if we keep going the right direction, COVID wise. Yeah, yeah, hope so. Right on. Well, we're hope really happy you could be here, man. Yeah, yeah. So see you guys soon. Yeah, for sure. Thanks a lot for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. That's been X Men One Hundred and Nine. Woo! Group of Seven Comics, previously in X Men. Chris, everything good with you? <sighs> Always. Do you want to, anything else we need to say? No. Well, actually, I do want to say three shout outs because we have a few new subscribers on our channel. Uh, thank you, Adam Gonzalez. Thank you, Matthew Vadman. And thank you, Dave Praetorius. Appreciate I hope I hope you like the content we're delivering you. So thanks. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night to the guys in the chat. Obviously, Trevor and Jason have been around like the whole night. And really good to have you guys on board. Yeah, so well thank done. you for that. Chris, Scott, love you guys. Talk to everyone soon, and Chris will talk to you in five minutes. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, all.